Step careful into this house I am, this body of rooms. If I don't break up the boards of these floors, shatter open these windows and doors, this body shall become my tomb. I, I walk myself like a hallway. In each door, my finger traces. In these rooms, a woman is not living and a little girl needs forgiving. I gotta restructure this structure into fleshly spaces. So I'm releasing the birds that have dreams and letting the, the sky catch the screams that I thought were just creaks beneath the floorboards. I'm gonna let these demons tear my seams cause in light, they're not the dark that they seem, mere remnants of the pain and shame this poet hoards. A little black girl lives in that room. Now I ain't been in there in a while. She get right up in my ear whispering stories I don't wanna hear, but how could I be scared of a little child every time I open the door to that room? She's got this heavy need that looms. She plays hide and seek to make me guess that little girl needs more than I possess. I don't go in that room. Cause she's got this closet that has floors that are made of quicksand where she plays games with this grown man, this well-respected and known man. And he ain't got no kids of his own, man. He likes to tickle and touch her little stone. And my God, just leave the kids alone. And this little girl then made a clone and another and another. So she ain't alone and she ain't gotta hear his grunts and groans. And I can't save her now cause that bird has flown. But so all these tiny drones and clones, they play inside that room alone. And I, I stand outside that room like stone. I let them pretend I'm never home. I mean, I tiptoe past that room. And across the hall is the lady Michelle just told you about. Some insane lady that screams and shouts a lot of rage that I would rather live without. Every time I open that door, she cusses me out, calls me a coward and blacks me out. I pretend like I don't know what she's mad about but she wanna pick me up and shake me out. So all my bullshit falls right out and she can live a life without so much to say without a mouth and being haunted by the little girl across the hall who laughs so loud, flinging blood on the wall. She's not the kind of kid that plays with ropes and dolls. I mean, she teeters on the edge of these halls like a too high cliff and she's always about to fall. There are many wild girls and women that my rigid structure consumes. I'm saying this house is not a house. This is my body of rooms where dreams split apart, birthing black roses that bloom and climb and twist vine. I'm saying this house is not a tomb. And I care not if you love what you find in my rooms. I care not if you're silent or you're prone to dimming lights because I'm riding for the old woman who roams my hallways at night, thinking she's nothing except despair and doom, but I'm not gonna let them die, leaving only pain is heirloom, believing the hallways are safer than living these rooms. I got some beautiful rooms, beautiful rooms. I am opening the door to my chaotic rooms. This house is not a tomb. This black rose can still bloom. I make the choice to make a home of this body of rooms. Welcome and thank you. I'm going now. Inina. Um, the thing I wanted to say about that poem, and I guess I'll make this part of this introduction is when Aisha wrote me about, well, first of all, I wanna let you know that um, I'm a, a rape survivor and an incest survivor. The rape was always easier for me to talk about and working in crisis centers, it was easier for me to engage that part of myself. Um, it wasn't until many years later that I realized that I had not been paying attention to the child who had been abused inside myself. And a lot of these complications came up for me. Um, these images came up for me when Aisha um, asked me to be a part of Love with Accountability because I thought I was so clear. I thought I was already whole and moving you know, very powerfully in my survivorhood. And what that made me reckon with was the fact that I never went back and got my little girl. And I realized that I had been treating her like everybody else had treated her. I had put her into a room 
with all of her thoughts and feelings. And I left her there. And I thought that that was part of survival. It never occurred to me that she might have things to say with my grown body. It never occurred to me um, that she was still feeling things. It never occurred to me that she had never been cleaned, was still bloody and soiled in the places where she had been hurt. It never occurred to me that I was killing her. And I was forcing her to live the life that I thought I had been forced to live. And so it was work and it was a blessing to be able to go back and get her. Um, but now, so I'm inside this house with these beings and what happens with little girls that, that you leave silence for a long time. She started running wild in my house, in my relationships and everything. And I had to give her the freedom to do that while also trying to stay in charge of my own life as an adult. I think it's important is what I wanted to say that any survivor of child sexual assault the healing that we do as adults is important. When we go to therapy, it is very important that we do that and address how it's manifested in our lives as adults. But one of the things that I think that we neglect to do, and especially women of color, more particularly Black women, we have so much stuff that we have to, to hold. It is an enormous task to think that you have to go back now and save a child. But you don't realize that there's liberation to be found in that. I liberated myself when I went back and got her because I realized that even though I wasn't paying any attention to her, by doing so, I gave her leadership in most of the things that were going on in my life, including my relationships. She showed up everywhere. I was running from things. I was hiding things. I felt filthy and dirty and I didn't know it. I didn't think I deserved love. I was carrying everything that she learned in those closets and on those stairs taught to her by those grown men, I was still carrying all those things. And so that's how I wanted to open. I just wanted to say what a worthwhile process it is to go back and get her. We'll talk more about this as this goes on. And I do wanna um, pass it along. I believe Ignacio is next, but one of the greatest journeys I've ever been on is the journeys to find the different parts of myself that had been hurt, that had been violated. Um, and see their worth and integrate those beings back into myself to make myself whole. I feel whole sitting here talking to you. Messy, yes, you know, because we have a lot of work to do inside, but whole. And that's powerful and it's liberating for me. So welcome to this journey that we're about to take you on. I hope that you will also invite the little girls or the little boys inside yourselves or your non-gender children selves. Bring those who were violated um, into the space. And even if you're not able to do it with us today, take some time to go back and have that conversation. And I think you'd be surprised with the young, what your young self still has to share. Thank you. Thank you, Emina, that was beautiful. <clears throat> I love hearing your poetry. And as you were speaking, I was just like, oh, I wrote these notes down because I'm, I'm always like, I'm gonna just speak from the heart, but you made me think of a lot of things with that piece that you just shared. So thank you so much. Um, so I'm gonna share a little bit about my story and why, why I do the work I do and how I do the work I do. Um, and why I think this is like a very, very, very important topic for everyone to be talking about, not just at Sexual Assault Awareness Month or with organizations that that work on this and know that this is important, but even within the organizations doing this work, there uh, there's a push and a challenge that I'm going to put forth. And this is what we, I think, the three of us are talking about today is um, really talking about child sexual abuse uh, prevention, uh, and it's something that we don't often talk about within the um, sexual assault um, prevention movement or circles. Um, child sexual abuse is uh, very siloed and separated uh, and uh, seen as a childhood issue and not a part of the, of the larger movement, which I think is a, a really uh, huge disservice um, and doesn't help us to, to move forward in, in finding prevention and ending. So, um, hi, my name is Ignacio um, and my uh, indigenous name is Utia Shaiti. Uh, I am a survivor of childhood sexual abuse uh, and incest and rape. And I am a trans identified person. Uh, I'm um, gender non-conforming or fluid, 
So I'm not a man, I'm not a woman, although I have experience living as a girl, experience living as a woman up until my 30s. Um, I have experience um, being viewed as a man, uh, a feminine man, a gay man, uh, but I identify as non-binary. And I say that very clearly because it's important to when we talk about sexual assault awareness and how we do the work and how gendered it is. <clears throat> So uh, I was, I'm a survivor and I have, uh, my abuse started when I was about eight years old, as far as I can remember. That's, just, that's as far back as I can remember, probably like eight. Uh, and it didn't um, end until I was about 15 years old and it was at the hands of my sister. And so um, many, 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 many years ago, that was something that we were just not talking about, female to female sexual abuse. Um, uh, it's, always, it's always seen as uh, males as uh, monsters and perpetrators and harm doers. And although that might be the, the large majority uh, as of now, with also knowing that most people don't, uh, don't report, most people don't wanna go through the criminal justice system and men and boys often don't report. Also, trans people and non-binary people often don't report, as well as women. So we know that we don't have uh, all of the numbers, but um, uh, we just didn't have that information back then. So I was really isolated and alone, uh, didn't know what was happening. I actually didn't know that it was sexual abuse that was happening. Uh, and when I got older and started questioning my sexual orientation, it's very confused because I thought that my abuse um, basically pushed me into this, um, this curiosity and identity. Um, and I totally like fought against that for so many years. But going like fast forwarding, um, my healing really shaped and um, talking about sex and sexuality uh, and, and sexual liberation. I kept thinking and talking to other survivors and doing my own healing, also doing a lot of artistic work to heal and, and work through that. And um, found that the common denominator was sex, um, fearing talking about sex. Uh, my, uh, you know, my, I guess, separation from sex and my body not understanding my boundaries, not even really understanding relationships or who I was within relationships. Um, I just didn't get any of that. And so as I kept learning and healing and going through therapy, sex, 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 sex kept coming up. And so I, what I try to do with, the, with my work in the HEAL project and how I've gotten here for more than 15 years of trying to do this work is really trying to do a cultural shift in society, a huge cultural shift as to what prevention and ending child sexual abuse actually looks like. I'm looking at root causes, not prevention as we see it now. It's usually after the fact and when something happens that is not prevention, that is reaction. And so prevention to me is about looking at systems and root causes of what this is. And the root, root causes really stems and it, uh, it affects all of us. Uh, and so through the Hill Project, we use media to do education to, with folks. We talked with families on how to talk to their children about sex and sexuality openly and honestly, not sugar-coated. We talked to survivors on how to heal um, despite uh, child sexual abuse, rape, incest. How do we get to our bodies? How do we form relationships? How do we love ourselves? And then working within movements to push uh, organizations and um, major movements uh, to look at uh, CSA prevention as a major uh, issue within all of our movements, because in every movement, there are survivors. And in every movement, there are harm doers. They are not exclusive from each other. And in movements, we are often, people at the farthest of the margins are the ones running movements making, you know, putting their lives on the line. And we also know that those people pushed farthest to the margins are the ones who are being sexually assaulted and raped. So we have a bunch of survivors 
um, you know, running uh, movements, doing damn good job at it, and also burning out, burning out, and um, and this is a big uh, issue within the movement. So I see this as a huge. Um, it's not separated. When we say CSA prevention, it means that we are abolishing and breaking down systems of anti-blackness, white supremacy, um, sexism, and all of these things because all of those things need to happen in order for the CSA not to occur. And it's a widespread issue that is used as a tool of war. That is a tool for many, many horrific things. Uh, and so um, this is something that's really near and dear to my heart as, as uh, my own personal healing um, is happening and community healing with everyone and really trying to shift how we think about sex and not be so fearful because fear is what's killing us. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, I'm I'm in the afternoon. Good morning <laughs> to people on the West Coast. I um always like to begin with the word libation, and I want to open with two quotes from the two Tonys. If your house ain't in order, you ain't in order. It's so much easier to be out there than right here. That's Tony K. Bambara, Black feminist writer who um, joined the ancestors in 1995 um, after a um, short but intense battle with colon cancer. And what you do to children matters. They might never forget. That's Nobel laureate and high, another high priestess of writing, Toni Morrison. Um, so I think about, first, my name is Aisha Shahida Simmons, and it's, I'm really glad to be here with my dear sibling, survivor, friends, comrades, confidants, co-conspirators in creating, co-creating a world without violence. And really happy we were able to do this. We were going to do it last year before the pandemic. and. Um, and so just happy to be able to share the virtual space. And thank you, Michelle, and everyone at WixApp for making this possibility, um, this panel a, a, a possibility. So I, um, I don't know what I was thinking when I said I was going to go after Ignacio and, and Nina J. First of all, Nina J's poetry always just like takes me places, um, very powerful and important places and reminds me of spaces and rooms that I still keep locked, even 27 years of doing this work. And um, Ignacio just always challenges me in, in, in yeah, and I, 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 and I say challenge, I don't, because sometimes challenging can sound like a really negative thing for me. It's, 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 I think it's an important and powerful thing to be, to remember. Of course, I know being a, a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and, and, and uh, adult sexual violence, um, how sex is at the root of all of this. And so often when we talk about sexual violence, we will, I've heard and I have said, let me speak about what I, you know, like, oh, this is not about sex um, because we really want to be clear that it's an act of violence and it's power and it's control and all of that is true. And yet sex is a part of these violent acts. Um, and so to not talk about it, um, the ugly, as well as the good and pleasurable, I think does a tremendous disservice for all of us and especially children. Um, I want to just off to say I'm I'm coming from the ancestral lands of the Anacostan and Piscataway uh, indigenous people, other also known as Washington D.C. Very much aware that this is colonized land, and in the unique, not only Aisha unique, but unique position, um, being a descendant of ancestors who were part of the one of the most egregious forms of human trafficking, um, also known as enslavement. So being descendants of captured people on, <laughs> on stolen land is a, is a very complex reality. I also think it's important in terms of just recognizing um, that 
from Canada over down through North America, all the way through the Caribbean, um, all the way down to Chile and Argentina. Um, it's all stolen, confiscated land. And so much of it, all of it has been impacted by brutal forms of violence and a lot of it by enslavement. So genocide of indigenous people, stolen land, enslavement, forced migration. So that's, that, that is foundational to this hemisphere. And while we know this, the forms of violence that we're talking about today are global realities, I just wanna think about the Americas and clearly being in the United States, I wanna talk about that, but also just recognizing and don't wanna be US centric um, in the context of talking about these forms of atrocities um, to recognize that this is something that is happening from top to bottom over here in this in this uh, bottom to top, you know, depending on how we're looking at at the earth because it is round. We don't necessarily have to be at the top <laughs> because some Europeans have decided that this way we should look at the map. Um, I want to just read uh, a little um, um, some words from the introduction to the Love with Accountability anthology, which I'm really grateful that. Um, Nina J and Ignacio, um, along with 38 other courageous um, survivors of African descent throughout the diaspora uh, participated. Um, and so the first thing that I always strive to do is just declare the space as sacred space. And so we're in virtual spaces. So I really invite, if you have not already through um, um, Nina, Nina's invocation through her powerful reading of Body of Rooms to declare your space sacred space, at least for the time that we are here together. When is the right time to talk about child sexual abuse? Even in our heightened contemporary awareness about sexual violence, we still do not talk about child sexual abuse, especially when it happens in families. How does one initiate in public spaces the often silenced dialogues about any form of sexual violence, most especially child sexual abuse? How does one begin the conversation in the midst of the justifiable righteous outrage about the rampant and virulent racialized violence perpetrated against diasporic Black, Indigenous, Latinx, Arab, and South Asian people, undocumented immigrants, Muslims, transgender, intersex, gender non-binary, physically and mentally disabled people, deaf and hard of hearing people, and other marginalized people. How do we have these dialogues about sexual violence in the midst of the violence committed against our youth through our failing, underfunded and militarized public schools, the school to prison pipeline, the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, which is dishoarding disproportionate numbers of Black, Latinx youth, and Indigenous youth into the prison industrial complex? How do we have these conversations where there are currently two members, at least, of the United States Supreme Court who are known and alleged to have committed gendered sexual harm? I believe Anita Hill. I believe Dr. Christine Plazi Ford, excuse me. Everything that radical, disabled, deaf, and hard of hearing, able-bodied, cisgender, transgender, gender non-binary, people of color, and anti-racist white people have fought and died for for over decades is being dismantled before our very eyes. We are in the midst of an inferno of human rights violations in the United States that have global ramifications. Yet, if we continue to keep child sexual abuse on the back burner, this pandemic, and I wrote this before COVID, so I'm talking about the childhood sexual abuse pandemic, will remain here, barely addressed, where millions more children suffer silently. Sexual violence is pervasive and touches upon almost every single social justice issue, including, but not limited to race, gender, gender identity, disability, sexuality, education, housing, immigration, healthcare, mass incarceration, militarization, and politics. This is sacred, sacred space. I believe that child sexual abuse is a core factor in most forms of sexual violence that people commit. Therefore, in this time of heightened awareness around sexual violence among adults, 
I invite and encourage all of us to prioritize the occurrence, treatment, and research about child sexual abuse. I am a survivor of child sexual abuse and adult rape. And like Nina, um, and um, and also like Ignacio, but in, in different ways, I, I believe, um, I, I, I could talk about what happened to me as a, um, I shouldn't say different reasons for diff for different reasons in terms of Ignacio. Um, for me, I struggled with talking about the um, my childhood sexual abuse, um, and so I could spend all day talking about my rape. Um, and I know for many people they can't talk about adult rape, so I don't. But I'm just saying that for me, it's just very fascinating as someone who's worked in. In, in this movement as a culture worker since 1994, that it really wasn't until 2015 that I really began to dig up my own roots around childhood sexual abuse um, and, and really coming to grips with, as Ignacio pointed out, around the ways in which my not dealing with my CSA, even though I always identified as, I would say I'm an incest and rape survivor all the time, could easily say that, but I could never go into the details. And I'm sure that that played a role in how I not only moved in the world, how I engaged with my friends, my loved ones, all that, but also in terms of my work. So I made a film titled Know the Rape Documentary, and I didn't, I barely touched childhood sexual abuse. I, I, I mentioned it, like touch it, and then I just run away from it. Um, and um, and both my parents who were bystanders to the harm that I experienced, it was my grandfather who um, harmed me. Um, they're very prominently featured in the film. Um, my mother is a survivor and an activist and my father is an activist, a human rights activist, both of them doing a lot of important work around um, gender violence and other forms, racial justice in this country. And yet they did not protect their daughter when their daughter told them what happened. Um, they um, protected, the, they chose to, and I don't think it was like they said, I'm not going to protect my child. I don't think anybody does that, or very few people do that, but they chose to save the world, and in, in, in saving the world, or working towards saving the world, they sacrificed me, and so how how do we how do we hold all of the complexities? And when I when I think about what Ignacio is sharing about their sister and the harm that they experienced um, for years at the hands of their sister um, at a time when no one was talking, still people are barely talking about um, um, sexual violence committed by um, by females by uh, women identified women. We don't talk about that. Um, as Nina talked about in terms of doing all of her incredible work in, in rape crisis centers and, and talking about her rape um, and yet not dealing with the little girl who was wounded and, and, how, do, and how does that all um, play it, itself out in, in how we move in the world and, and um, yeah, how we move in the world. And then, and I wanna, and as soon as I finish these few comments, then we will be in dialogue together, Ignacio and Nina, just thinking about what does it mean as um, members of a community that is um, under siege, has been under siege since 1619. And then if we factor in, you know, yeah, at least in this, in this, in this country um, and earlier, if we're moving outside of US borders in this hemisphere, um, where it's clear that in the words of black feminist lesbian poet, we were never meant to survive. So how do we, how do we hold the trauma that, um, that we've experienced and, how, and the accountability that we're deserving in knowing that the systems that are set up allegedly to provide accountability are solely committed to our annihilation. There are too many examples. And I don't, let me be very clear, I'm an abolitionist and I don't believe in policing. Um, uh, and there are so many examples um, of people calling the police to get help and they're murdered. So what does that look like? And how do we hold all of these complexities? Um, and that's what I strive 
um, attempted to do in with the anthology, inviting my sibling um, contributors to not only share about the harm that they experienced, that we experienced, but also to envision how we can uh, disrupt and end this violence um, without relying on the systems that are set up to, to destroy us. And how can we do that in a way in which one day there will be a generation, perhaps not in my lifetime, that will look back and, and say, wow, people did this. And so that's what I think about in terms of meaning when I say people did this, they committed um, violence against children, against adults, um, and um, without any form of um, uncompassionate accountability. Um, and so I'll, I'll stop there and invite uh, Nina and Ignacio to come and be pinned with me. <laughs> uh, I wanted to uh, say something that both um, Inina and you were talking about in terms of, you know, like, you, Inina, you talked about healing, you know, how do you, um, saying that you were going back, you know, to talk to the little girl, take care of the little girl, you know, um, and I've, I've often said that as well, you know, uh, not forgetting that little girl, um, which speaks to healing, right, how we're in constant healing, or we have the ability to constantly heal and grow, and then um, Aisha, you're talking about how do we hold these complexities, and I'm thinking, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot about how do we like holding the complexity of healing and doing this work, right? Especially us, right? We do this work. <laughs> I will never stop doing this work, even if I don't get paid for it. I mean, for the first 15 years, I was doing this work without any money. And then I got, we got funding from Just Beginnings Collaborative. How many years ago? What, five, six years ago? 2016. And since then, I have not received any funding for my project, right? Because, and I, and I really truly believe it's because it is focused on child sexual abuse because it's such a silo and people don't think that this is associated with them. And so and holding these complexities of being a survivor, knowing that we still have work to do until the day we leave our physical bodies, right? To, to work on us, and also to put, to put, you know, ideas, content, work, sweat, love, all of this into this movement that we believe um, needs to be like talked about in a big way, and um, and holding these complexities, like like I said before, we're in the movements ourselves, doing the stuff. How many of us burn out? How many of us need to go into a facility for a while? How many of us need to? you know, adjust our medication or something because it's too much. And I think it's too much because we don't get the, um, the support and visibility of the importance of this pandemic. You know, I think with what has happened with uh, Black Lives Matter, um, that, uh, that push, that, that huge um, visibility and how people have completely shifted and are really talking about white supremacy in a way that they have never talked about it and how white people have been stepping up in such big ways and we're having great conversations about different kinds of rep reparations. This is the kind of conversation I want to have about CSA, right? And I think that because we're talking about anti-Blackness and police brutality through Black Lives Matter, this is a huge opening for us because to me, when I think about ending CSA, that is ending anti-Blackness. That is ending white supremacy because this is the ways in which we, um, we the ways in which we value Black bodies and or not, um, the ways in which uh, Black bodies and brown bodies uh, are seen as stronger and don't need any kind of assistance or help. They're eas we're easily more seen as perpetrators, as harm doers. Um, so, all of these things kind of like they meld into one another like um this is not just about csa prevention it's about um how we relate to one another i think it all boils down to our relation our connections because when we talk about uh you know um not not a you know, calling the cops and, you know, um, thinking about abolishing prisons and we're thinking about accountability and we're talking about, you know, all of these issues. 
all of these issues are around how we relate to one another and how we make decisions about one another, right? Um, in terms of, if we see someone that's a harm doer as a monster, we're not gonna see, we're not gonna see them as a person we relate to. It is very easy to throw a monster in prison and it is very easy to say, I hope that monster gets raped, right? If we see this person as another human that has the ability to possibly be rehabilitated, that um, none of us are too far from being a harm doer <laughs> or a, a, a survivor, that we have uh, compassion and that we can um, think of alternative ways of, of addressing this, then more people, I think more people would access help because as we all know, if people of color, especially black people are not connected to, we don't wanna call the cops. Like we don't want to call the cops. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole cycle that feeds within itself. Um, and we're not getting people um, the healing that they need. Um, and we're not getting the visibility that we need because of that. Nina, did you want to weigh in? <clears throat> and you're on mute, just so you know. Mute, you're on mute. Huh? You're on mute. Yeah, I, I agree with the, the opening, the door opening. I see everything in images. So Ignacio, when you said that you saw the door that's open inside the movements of Black Lives Matter and everything that's going on, I saw it, but then I felt in, uh, like a sense of panic because I know that, so, that door is open for so many things. And so it's hard for me to imagine the door being open for that because so many things can go in there. And I think that this one will be left in a... Um, diluted and watered down so I think our work around child sexual abuse has to always be named and be centered and with a stated purpose because even with me if it's not named that I'm going to drift away from it and it's the, it's the work I really don't want to do so I, I would like to see us going forward um, naming spaces that are specifically for that and I'm yeah, let me think more about this thought. What do you think about that? Yeah, I, I, um, for me, I, it, it, there's, there, there's a lot. Like I do, I, I'm, I'm glad that we are talking about, um, white supremacy and the ways in which. I didn't even know would be possible in terms of on a mass mediated way. I don't want to act like, you know, we, there have been many people who've been talking about white supremacy, but in, in, in BIPOC spaces, but I'm, I'm talking about what has happened. And you mm -hmm. see um, there, there is a lot of awareness there. Um, I think that it, I think the, the, the work, because, and I don't want to go into a whole kind of uh, conversation around BLM at all but I, I feel like with that whatever whatever is the thing that receives visibility that work is how do we um how do we channel it in 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 the direction um and recognizing that things are always evolving and changing but not how do we challenge it how do how do we work to make sure it's not co-opted right because what I find that what I observe is um, that it be that anything right can just be kind of co-opted or commercialized or like it's got to fit into some kind of neat box. And I feel like the work of of BLM, the the anti for some of us in the anti-sexual violence movement, um, that it's really radical um, radical work um, that we're we're talking about undoing. Um, generational violence centuries of violence um and 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 really envision envisioning that which doesn't exist so i think that and how do we do all of that right um it, while centering centering the survivors i mean i think that that is that is my constant work my personal work i am very clear that for me, the response is not to, to call the police um, really for anything, 
but definitely in response from, you know, in, in response to sexual violence. And so then what does that mean? What does that look like if we are not calling the police? And I think, and so there's that. And then, and there's a lot of important critical work that needs to happen. And that is happening, not that it's not happening. There's so many organizations, collective individuals who are thinking about that. And then how do, how do, how do we hold that while we are centering or, and holding the survivors? Often, often recognizing that the people who have committed the harm against the survivors are also survivors. That it, it becomes a, a very, um, this, this, this complex web of those who've experienced the most immediate harm, like, you know, the, the most immediate harm, and then those who've committed the harm in often in, in response to unaddressed trauma that they haven't experienced. And so, and I, I credit a lot of survivors, several of whom are um, contributors to the anthology, who really are very clear about you know, disrupting criminal justice as it, as we know it, and yet and also being like but that we don't want to lose sight or of the work around um, survivors, around making sure that they're okay. And that's something that I find, like I said, that that that's that that line of walk of of, walk, of that we're walking, um, or I'm walking or moving. Don't want to use um, ableist language. Just really wanting to be clear around centering um, the needs of, of, of survivors and providing um, alternatives. So, you know, because I think that a lot of people, you know, there, there are a lot of people who do want, you know, people to be locked up and stuff like that, but there are a lot of people who don't. They really just want accountability. They want to make sure they're going to be okay and safe and, you know, um, and so it's, it's really about how do we present those options. I think that's the separation between this idea of justice and healing, right? Um, because when a sexual assault happens or CSA happens, right, it's, it's almost a knee-jerk reaction. Um, people think either you say cops or don't call the cops, depending on who you are, right? Knee-jerk reactions because we don't have any other mechanism that we have ever thought of in place to help us with this intimate very large issue, right? Police were never uh, created to, to help with sexual, but they're not counselors. They're not, they don't know, how, that's not their job. Like, so for, to call police is ridiculous to me because they're not uh, equipped to handle these things, right? So this, would go, this is what goes back to me about relations, right? Like, because when that happens, we always think police, right? But if we had a different, um, cultural shift and a different foundation about how we relate to one another, we would be living very differently. We would be more vulnerable with each other, sharing things with each other um, and doing more community engagement, right? So that when something happens, it would be like probably back in the day when you go to your neighbor or your family member or something, because this is so integrated about talking things out, right? We're not going outside to call a cop to come in to regulate a, a situation because that, that it, it almost um, contributes to the idea that we don't have the capacity to manage um, or to come up with uh, creative ideas or solutions for ourselves. Like it's just called the cops and it is completely out of our hands. To me, that is not the beginning of healing. That is probably the beginning of, and I'm gonna put this in quotes, justice. Because if you go through the criminal justice system, to me, that's not justice. That's my opinion. And then the person often gets lost in that. They're, the healing is not front and center. And so because that healing never happens, that gets stuck here. And we're just, we're just concentrating on putting people on the criminal, uh, in, in prisons and on the sex offender registry as if that's stopping or changing anything. But it, it really is about changing that knee-jerk reaction to who do I call? How, who can I trust? How can I process through this horrific thing without calling the cops? We don't have that. I, think we, I don't think we've thought about that. And that is visioning how we can change that, especially we know that if we call somebody, they have to call the cops, right? If they're mandated reporter, right? So this allows, this tells us I can't call 
a therapist or a counselor or something because they're going to call the cops. So the way the system is now, it it uh, blocks so many people from accessing actual healing. I just want to uh, just add a quick thing. Um, like initially when Aisha uh, approached us about doing this love with accountability, her and I had several, I frustrated her a great deal because I didn't know how I wanted to approach the work. And working in rape crisis centers and 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 doing marches and stuff like that, I was it was just very easy for me to to focus on the politics of rape and all of the politics. But I knew that for me, and and in the book, everybody talks about the different places where they um, address accountability, whether that be systems, the criminal justice system, um, the parents or workplace. It was important for me, and I knew, and it's important for me right now. Um, to 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 bring the child back into the room um, because she doesn't know how to have these conversations and she's not interested in them actually um, and not that they're not important but she's inside me now like what what are you doing what are you doing are you doing it again you're focusing on this other stuff and you're letting all this other stuff take over what me and you got going on you know that's how she's talking to me right now and so um, especially when we talk about other movements and especially black people that live in black bodies were always so busy taking care of other people that I think sometimes that we feel very selfish and very self-centered and arrogant when we focus that on ourselves. And that's the fight that I'm having with myself. Like I want to join this part of the conversation with Ignacio and Aisha, but in love with accountability, that's the voice I gave my child. So I want to get over there with them, but I can't, I won't, you know? So I want to just do this for her to say that she's present in the room and that, that she's important. And these are not the needs, these are not the things that she's concerned with. She's trying to figure out how me and her can get through the next relationship without me you know, killing somebody in my heart and in my mind unnecessarily. She's trying to figure out um, how I can walk, just walk around the world and like my body and feel good and learn to love sex and you know, all those kinds of things. So um, I feel inadequate when I want to bring just the child into the room, but that's a fight I have with myself because there's so much stuff that we have to work on in the world. She seems so unimportant and I just can't let her be that for me. So I just wanted to take this space to let y'all know she's in the room and um, she's acting out and I'm letting her, that's all. I'm glad you, you shared that. You know, it's so interesting, um, Nina, when it, there's something, you know, I, I was thinking about that today and I know I was thinking about it precisely because you are in this room um, because I was thinking about when we did the, um, the, the virtual book talks and um, initially we're having conversation. Um, there were several last year after in response to COVID because we couldn't go do book readings. There were at least seven or eight uh, virtual book talks because there are 40 contributors. Um, and so in the group, that um, e Nina uh, J was in that where we had the book talk, we were having a similar time in prep work, we were having a similar conversation parallel, not the same exact at all. And you brought, you brought your, you brought your little girl in the room and you were like, I want to tell my story. Like, I don't, I mean, we can talk about all this other stuff that's important, but I want to tell my story. And I've been thinking a lot about, I, so I, I was thinking about this today in this context and even as I was preparing for our, our sharing today and the workshops, our individual workshops later, because I've been thinking about why, why do I all, like go, like I automatically go in, in the direction which I, I went in like, you know, the systems, supremacy, all of that, and that's real. And I, I, I just wanna, I share and I, I don't I mean, I've shared with you privately, you know, as my friend, but I think that I, you know, as, as a survivor, as a particularly childhood sexual abuse survivor, who told, I told my parents what was going on. So it wasn't like, this wasn't hindsight or whatever. I said, this is what's happening. And they did not remove me. And my parents are, as I said, were, and still are activists that I, it was, I was told that that wasn't important. And so I, I know that I struggle personally with, with talking about, um, we're talking about the violent, like talking about the, the personal impact. And 
I always am worried, right? Like trigger warning. So like, even when I was reading from the book, I was very clear, like, I can't read this. I can't read that because I don't want to trigger anyone. And I respect that. I want to be really clear. And yet I'm triggered all the time. Every time I see, I, I don't even see, but when I know there's going to be some image of somebody being murdered by the police, you know, just and how that's, and it's almost expected that we have a responsibility to see what's happening so we can witness it and speak about it, speak truth to justice on behalf of this person, that person, et cetera. And in fact, there's been like saying part of the reason that Breonna Taylor didn't get justice is unlike George Floyd, we didn't get to see the violence, quote unquote. I mean, I've, I've seen that, I've heard that. And yet when it comes to sexual violence, where we have to, you know, always be mindful. And I'm not, this is, and I'm, I understand, I, I get triggered easily besides with my own story. I don't get triggered my story, but I get triggered hearing other people's story. So I've been holding that. I'm holding that now in, in terms of you bringing that awareness around what is that? Not what is that? I don't want to figure that out in this conversation, but just around how we're so kind of boundaried and protected and we got to talk about systems and all of that. And yet it's, for me, it is the stories, right? It is the stories. It's the, it's the stories that let us know what happened. It is the telling of the stories, the sharing of the stories that, um, can create roadmaps of sorts. Um, and yet for me, my default is always to go to the system. Yeah. Me too. You know, it's easier for me to talk about it uh, as an adult survivor. It's easier for me to talk about being kidnapped and my uncle on top of me in the house. And I told two, Aisha, you know, I told two and I never heard anything afterwards. So I never said, I never told again, you know, but and not only that, but we're in public, you know, there's something about talking about these things and this is a professional setting. And so the paradox that lives there, we're in a professional setting naked <laughs> and trying to talk professionally. But, you know, that's another wall that we have to break down too. I don't want, I'm not a professional, you know, I know about this, but I'm not going to be pushed you know, into to something or some person that needs to talk about things in a certain way. And I hear you about the trigger warnings, but one of the things I've been thinking about, I've built myself in a way, I'm, if you see me coming, it's a trigger warning because we've built this world into such a violent place. It's not possible that nobody is gonna be triggered. I'm more interested in figuring out what we can do. What are you gonna do once you get triggered? And whose job is that? You know, are you taking care of yourself? Are you being revolutionary for yourself? Are you holding yourself accountable for your healing? You know, there's work that you can do without giving me the work of silencing myself because you can't handle it. Now I say that with love and understand I'm used to being in rooms full of, full of white women and a lot of fragility. There's a lot of triggering going on in there, but they don't give thought to the ways that I'm triggered and I've learned to move with those triggers because I have to, I have to keep living. So I do encourage other survivors, we got to have these conversations. I encourage us to do that work on ourselves and not walk into rooms. If you know that you're going to a sexual assault seminar and you get triggered, then don't fucking go, but don't silence other people because you're not there and you're healing. You know, sorry about the fucking word, but, um, uh, sorry. That's, that's it, I just, um, I was going to say that um, this, to me, it's to say we're talking about how um, abundant and diverse the, the movement is, right? Because there are lots of people who are survivors and are talking about systems and stuff and lots of people who are survivors that are telling their stories and all of it, all of it is important, like, because the stories have to be told in order for the, the visibility for people to understand the impact, what's going on. And we need to be talking about it as adults, as we get older. We need to see more 50, 60, 70 year olds talking about how CSA has impacted them so we can see the long-term effects. We know it's there, right? So the yeah. stories are absolutely vital and we need to be doing this root work for those who are able, those who are in the right place, those who can cycle in and out of it, because we all have things that we're holding, you know, at the same time. So I think those who can and able, we do think about, we have to think about the root work and it's, it's a balance, right? It's like healing, storytelling, root work, all of that together 
it's like a sphere. It's like all of that has to happen at the same time so that we can absolutely get to a place where we can say, I remember the first time I said, I want, um, I work to prevent and end child sexual abuse. First time I said end, it kind of shocked me. And I was like, is that possible? Can we fucking end child sexual abuse? Because it is everywhere. It is so in everything. Talk about war, talk about immigration, talk about just the other day, I had a workshop that I was talking about how CSA prevention must be integrated into all social movements. And one example, I was like, it should be integrated into, you know, a movement for, you know, talking about climate change. And people are like, how is CSA connected to climate change? And I was like, okay, let me give you one good example. There could be many, but one good example is this. We absolutely know that when catastrophes happen anywhere around the world, what usually happens in POC places, right? These catastrophes happen. Um, we know that poor people and people of color are more affected. We know that families are separated and we know that sexual assault and childhood sexual abuse skyrockets. It's just a fact, right? Because it's the perfect conditions for it, right? So if we know that this happens, why don't we have a national plan, a safety plan for children? If we live in a country that constantly says that children are the most important thing for the future, why don't we take care of them? Why don't we educate them properly? Why don't we teach them about sex and sexuality holistically? And why don't we have actually these uh, you know, safety plans? When Katrina happened, how many children were raped and abducted? How many people, women were raped? How many families were separated? That was horrific when that happened, right? And it's like, we start from scratch. If we know that this is, why don't we have some, something in place to, to provide for children, to help children um, and other, other things in place, right? We know the outcomes of things but we're not prepared for them because um, CSA, child sexual abuse, child abduction, all those things are just too hard, uh, not sexy. <laughs> not um, really catchy to talk about. You say child sexual abuse and people shut down. You try to get money from grant makers to talk about child sexual abuse, not sexy enough. It's not what we're talking about today, right? Um, it's, just not, it's just not the issue or the thing that people are really, really seeing as so vitally important and connected to uh, just the oppression of women, the, 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 the anti, you know, the, the hate of femininity, um, homophobia, transphobia, um, all of these things, um, even fat phobia and ableism, all of those things connect to uh, CSA and the, the children who are more uh, pushed to the margins and more likely to be sexually assaulted and violated because they're the fat kid that nobody fucking wants to talk to and people bother. It's the trans kid or it's the weird kid. It's the kid that you know um, doesn't have any friends, right? Are all these kids that are the weirdos, the outsiders, the whatever it is, we know these numbers, right? And so we need to see those connections and be talking about the, the systems as, and as well as the stories because and I'll just say one more thing about this white supremacy thing we talked about before, you know, like talking about, you know, we are in a different place and thinking about race in this country, which is great. Um, you know, people of color have been thinking about this forever. Uh, and, you know, I was talking to somebody the other day about uh, therapy. Uh, right now we're in mental health awareness month and um, thinking about the ways in which we heal from trauma, right? And so we often say, you know, therapy is a good route. And, um, and uh, a lot of people, especially a lot of people of color, are like therapy sucks. You know, like we can't find a therapist that's gonna help and right. And when you think about it, I like when you think about the, uh, when you go to anti-violence uh, conferences, when you go to places where they're we're full of therapists and counselors, the reality is that the rooms are filled with white women. Therapists, counselors, it's filled with white women. That is the, the highest level. So if 
if we are telling people to get therapy and the majority of people giving therapy are white women, are they competent, right? Are, are they getting the, the, the therapy that needs to happen culturally competent, which I hate that word, right? Where they are aware of things, right? Are we giving therapy? Are we healing in a way that's like intersectional and huge, right? Or are we having, again, yet another cookie cutter model for how we heal, which doesn't work for a lot of people, right? And then we see a lot of organizations popping up like the, what is it? The Black Trans Therapist Network and BEAM, Black Emotional, um, ooh, I forget the name, BEAM, B-E-A-M, I forget the, the acronym, but a lot of these uh, therapeutic counseling places are, you know, are being created for specific populations of people because healing isn't happening properly. And I think that that's a piece of it too. Yes, it is. I, I wanted to, there was something um, that I uh, wrote, um, published in, um, I think there's something um, that I think is really important for us to remember that, you know, healing is not a sprint. It's a long distance run where the goal is continuing and not ending. And, you know, I, I was reflecting on, you um, Ignacio, what you shared around, like, what does it mean, you know, to be 50, 60, 70 and a survivor? And I, I saw that there was a comment in, in, the, in the chat um, around, um, you know, the impact of, of their survival um, in, in their relationships. And I'm just, I'm 52 and I had an ex just a very recent experience where I, had been, I was harmed, nothing ma major, it was something happened in terms, when I said harmed, it was connected to some form of erasure. Um, and um, and I, I'm being vague intentionally because I don't want to get into all that right now. But the point is, is that I, I went to the, to the individuals who were erasing me um, <laughs> and to address it. And um, only, there were two and one responded but one kept responding on behalf of two and they were like oh person a is 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 really busy but I, I can talk to you and all that and and I realized you know I was glad that person b was willing to talk to me but I was like dag I mean person a couldn't even respond to the email to be like I'm really busy I hear your pain can we talk about it even if it was next month and I was I got so I mean I I was so enraged. I mean, this is yesterday. So I'm not, I want to be clear. This is not like some long-term thing. I was so enraged and I had, and I sat with it um, and um, to say, what's going on? You know, like, yeah, it's okay. I was angry that they weren't responding, but what's going on? And I was like, oh, there she is. It's 10 year old Aisha calling for help, you know, and not being, you know, not, and, and no, and no one's addressing it. Right. So while what happened was is not cool, but I realized that my rage didn't match what was going on. Like, you know, I didn't, the rage that I had was like, mm, what's happening? Why are you so angry? And it was, it, it, it was 10 year old Aisha. And so, and I, and I realized how that happened. So that kind of erasure, um, not important, um, no acknowledgement and then how, and then, then how I can just implode and how I have to, for me, it's, I have a, long-term meditation practice and, and just in, in tapping in from therapy and stuff, just really going, if I can catch the rage, sometimes I can't catch it. Sometimes the rage is out the door across the street and then I got to go and make amends for the rage and, you know, and rage for the harm, not for the rage. Let me be really clear. I don't think anything, it's not the rage, it's what, what I allow or sometimes I'm not even aware of what the rage does. So it's like, so yesterday I was able to see what was happening um, and, and, and not deny my rage, but just like, oh, okay. So there's a lot of rage here that you're upset because you feel betrayed by friends, but then that, that, un, uh, that unhealed trauma, even though I've been doing some healing work with, with my people, um, it's, it's still there. So just those kinds of, that kind of reality. And, and again, thinking about what Ignacio shared in their opening, um, comments around, like, how this impacts our movements because so many of us are survivors and that's why we're do that's what we're drawn to this work that's why we're doing it and if we're not doing our work our self work 
then it can really manifest itself in really detrimental ways. And then when we bring in all the other forms of oppression, um, Ignacio and I and others really went through a very I, uh, for traumatic experience in terms of it, what our, our previous fellowship where there was the, the dynamics that played out in the first two years was straight out of a childhood sexual abuse playbook around favorite and harm and secrecy and all of that. And so yet we were all funded, all survivors doing this work and yet it was played out on an institutional level. And so I, I, I invite us to, to think about that in terms of what are the wounded children in ourselves while we're doing this work and are they, do they need help and support? Chances are yes. And how can we, how can we individually address that and take care and, and tap in while doing this work that but not at a point as Nina's sharing of, of suppressing and pushing back and not we don't have time for that because if we don't it's going to rear that child is going to you know act out and understandably so they weren't cared for they weren't protected they weren't nurtured they were taught to lie I mean I learned that from Ignacio you know like CSA survivors are taught to lie you know we're and so it's and that's how we survive and so when people are lying or not you know all of that that we have to continuously look at these huge uh the huge picture which doesn't mean not holding people accountable but it means that if we don't talk about the wounded children within then you know it, it we will not fully address the work that we are called to do I love that you uh I love that you said that Aisha because that happens to me all the time in my relationships. You know what I'm saying? And think about us at these um all of these well, you know, movements, love meetings. So imagine a table full of women just about to talk about abolition or prison reform, anything like that, something really serious. But then go inside your mind if they're all survivors. Imagine all these little girls around the table with their hurt feelings and all that stuff and trying to do all of that professional stuff. I think I just want to acknowledge um, or leave room in my life for people to show up with that. And I do that too now in my relationship, in my relationships, I should be like, oops, I'm sorry. I snapped on you earlier. I didn't even know why I did that. I think the little girl in me felt like you were doing this because that's what she experienced. And my instinct was to lie about it because I was embarrassed. I mean, I just break the stuff down to the bones now because incest also taught me to hide from myself. You know, so I'm so afraid and, and I live so long with this stuff. I mean, I did, I'm just, the stuff you brought to me and stuff I'm just learning now have been inside me all the time. They were just in other rooms or in closets. I hid it from myself. So I, I just break it down now and I bring it all out and I like to do it out loud. I don't care how other people feel about it. I do it for myself because I don't want them hiding and everything about me is normal and natural. You know what I'm saying? And yeah, I just love that you said that. It just reminded me of a meeting filled with, you know, just little survivors around the table trying to be all grown with their grown people suits. And they don't know why you, you don't know why you mad at that girl. You know what I'm saying? You're not talking to him and all this bullshit that kids go through, that adults are acting out in these professional clothes. But a lot of it comes from that. Not feeling heard, feeling ignored, or she likes her more than me, you know, all of this stuff it comes out in these grown people rooms and conversations, that's all. Same happened, it's so funny, same happened with me just yesterday. Um, I Somebody was telling me something, sharing something with me and I got so upset and I was just like internally, like internally, I gotten really good at feeling all of the, this, just the nuttiness inside and then giving myself a beat to figure out how I'm gonna say something. Cause in the past it would be like, Bleh! And then now they're saying something and I'm like feeling it in my chest, feeling it in my throat. I'm like, you know, and then afterwards I was like, I feel really anxious right now. And I think we should talk tomorrow about this because I don't know what to say. And I had to say that because the little girl wanted to cry, wanted to say, why are you doing this? I'm not stupid. I have important things to say. Why are you bring, you know, taking down my ideas? They weren't doing that at all but that's what I felt like. And so um, taking that day to think about it, really, that, that, and that's a process. I, it's taken me decades to get to a place where I can say, I'm feeling a little off. That I'm more angry than I should be, right? <laughs> and so, 
And then that's when I can call Aisha or, you know, another friend and be like, can I talk to you and, you know, work this out. But it takes so, it takes a while to get to a place where we can figure that out. And I, I, I like to mention this a lot um, in terms of like healing and the little girl. And I bring this up specifically around being a trans person um, and, you know, having been, you know, um, having uh, had, you know, experienced child sexual abuse as a, as a kid, that for a lot of trans people, you know, um, talking about their experience of CSA as a child, you know, and, and as being an adult is really difficult, right? Depending on how that person identifies, right? So if you're talking, this is a trans man or a trans woman, you know, and needing to talk about what happened to them prior, you know, could be absolutely difficult and actually a double trauma, right? Thinking about that life, if there was, you know, um, dysphoria and stuff, every trans experience is different, right? So for me, that wasn't the case. For me, I feel very comfortable talking about being a, a woman, being a little girl, I'm fluid and that's a part of all of my experience, right? And I'm so glad that I feel comfortable talking about it. Because if I didn't, I don't know how I could get through this. I don't know how I could share with someone, you know, having that difficulty about my body, about, about society, about how they see me, you know, and, and it plays out in a lot of different ways, you know, um, in terms of how you get help, where you can get help when a lot of um, most support groups are for women. There's not a lot uh, I don't, I have not come across any that are for non, you know, non-conforming, fluid, you know, folks. Um, I have not come across that. And so I've been denied uh, support groups as a healer, as a person who works <laughs> for the how many decades in this work, it is like my life. I went to go get help and I was turned down because um, the women in the group would, feel, would have felt an uncomfortable with me in that, which speaks to the binary of how we do this work. Yeah. Um, because if we continue to do the binary, then we will not be able to see men, uh, trans boys, gender non-conforming trans women as survivors. Uh, and we will not see women and other people as harm doers as well, right? Uh, and so to speak to that little girl that I still love, um, I always say, I, I have like a, a practice for myself in my bedroom, I have a, my bedroom actually looks like a little girl's room, I have to say. My bedroom is pink and everything. I created my room as my space, safe space. It's a total pink room. I have a pink castle in the middle of my room. I have a whole bunch of stuffies. I have my coloring books. I, I take time to hang out with my little girl. I get nonverbal, I color, I do all of these things. I scream, I, get, I have my tantrums by myself. I allow myself the pleasure and the release that I did not have when I was a kid. And so to me, that's, that's therapy. And I love doing that because I get to tap into that little girl who was so wonderful and a part of my life. Um, and, who, and, and because it, it's who I am today because of that little girl, right? And, and I wanna honor, I wanna honor her. I want to give her space. I don't wanna forget her because she's still here. That pain is still here, right? And so and just thinking about how we tap into that little kid and also how we get creative and in tapping into that little kid when we're talking about gender non-conforming folks and trans people, how do we get creative in doing healing and stuff when we're so binary, right? I wanna come play in your room. My little girl likes that room. I, I totally have play dates, totally have play dates in my room. Love it, coloring together. <laughs> Wanted to say something else, maybe? Nah. Uh, do we do um, conversation? No. With we are doing conversation. So we have about thirteen minutes left. So I don't know if, I mean, I see people have been engaging in the chat, but because I'm trying to focus on the conversation, I'm not engaging with the chat. Are there? Does anyone have any specific like questions? Um, that you'd like to offer, and then as Michelle opened up, we're each um, we're each, I wish we, I want to go to everybody's workshop, <laughs> not mine. <laughs> but, that last night, I'm so upset about that part. Yeah, um, but yeah, I'm having separation anxiety. But um, 
but we will, you know, each of us will have, there will be breakout rooms, but if there's something you'd like to ask us in the space, this is a great time to do it because we have about 12 more minutes. Ignacio and Aisha, I miss you already. <laughs> Thank you all. It's been a long, long, lonely pandemic. Um, I'm looking through the chat and it's just a lot of just things are just resonating. Uh, um, people are sharing their own experiences, talking about their impact of their own abuse as well through here, uh, throughout this conversation. Um, one question that just popped up now is we've offered LGBT groups before and no one attended wanting to try again advice on how to help folks feel safe and welcomed to join group. Are you, um, can you clarify you're saying you um, asked LGBT groups to join um, what to come to workshops or like what specifically? Sarah, can you clarify in the chat? Oh, if I'm understanding it correctly, um, people, LGBT folks were invited? We offered a group just for LGBT plus folks, like a women's group or a teen group, um, but no okay. one attended. Mm -hmm. was, it, was it organized by LGBT plus folks? No, not at the time. So I, I would say that that would be a plus plus right there. Um, if you, you know, reach out to some LGBT plus folks who might want to collaborate or want to um, be lead and like sharing their voices as to how they think that this group, group could be run because, you know, it speaks to their life and identity. Um, and then have those people be like the, the people who put the, the info out, right? Because sometimes as organizations, like as at the HEAL Project, we have a very specific expertise. Anything outside of that, I know stuff, but I'm gonna collaborate with people who are experts on that so that they can tell that much better. And then I can learn from that as well. So I, I'd say collaboration is important, especially with, um, I, I think the people that are in marginalized groups, you know, people of color, black folks, you know, LGBT, you know, Q plus folks. Um, we, we are, I know for myself, I'm always looking for little, um, examples of like if somebody says hey this is a, a group for black survivors i want to know who's running it who's facilitating it what you know because i always have questions i'm always thinking this is bullshit because this is this is historically that's the way it's been <laughs> so i got i need i need uh, questions answered so possibly um having a little bit more transparency uh and folks uh you know participating in that outreach um, could could help and also I would say, um, cause I, I, this happens a lot and um, is that, you know, I mean, clearly LGBTQ people are not a monolith. So I'm on, that's obvious, right? Like, but then th there's also, I think that I invite you to consider having a, a space for queer people of color um, as well, you know, in, in terms of, yeah, I think that, that that also can play a role. Cause I know for me, I'm just like, unless I'm clear that the group has some kind of understanding, some kind of, you know, dismantling white supremacy framework, I'm not going in that room to deal with, like let my survivor vulnerable self child come out and then I have to deal with racism and all of that in, in that way. So I think that that's something that, you know, also has to be, um, considered even like I see that even with like women any kind of spaces that if it's racially diverse that you know that there is some time at least for people of color or even breaking it down beyond that like black folks Asian folks Latino folks you know because they're just some unique uh, experiences and realities and pain and trauma and it's so hard to talk about all of it anyway so to have to hold the other space like just to think about you know or at least putting that in the announcement like there will be breakouts as well you know like this is if you don't we're like oh we can't have two different groups of creating space for for that and i see there's some um in the q a um uh i don't um questions so yeah there's there's two here um oh, okay the 
next one is from Sherry. It says, I have a, an adult daughter who was raped uh, when she was 15 months old. I have worked in the victim service field for the past 35 years. I worry my work harm her, harms her. Any thoughts? Um, so the, the person writing, you're saying that um, the work that you do might harm the, the child who is a survivor? Correct. Okay. I mean, I, I, I would say that, that you, this is, you just don't know, right? Um, this is, there's no easy answer for it because I think that on one end, uh, what a beautiful thing that you have all the knowledge and understanding and, you know, like resources to help this child, right? And then on the other hand, um, sometimes uh, uh, being exposed too much to something can be a little too overwhelming, right? So I think that maybe a if there is no separation between the, the ways in which you talk about work or bring work home or anything, maybe that could be a little limited and it's not integrated fully into the home, right? To have some clear boundaries around work and life. Um, I think it's a good start, um, but I don't think there's a clear cut answer because people really experience things so differently. And the daughter might be like, this is fucking awesome because I had all the support I ever needed, right? <laughs> and it could also go another way. So we just don't know. But I think that um, as the child grows, really listening to them, asking them questions and having boundaries around um, work life. Because I know as this work for me, this is, this is, this is everything that I do, right? And I have to be very good about self-care. I really have to be good about this stuff because it can really overwhelm and overtake you. I just wanted to add something quickly. Um, when working in the center is one of the things that I'm looking back and noticing because I've recently come into contact with a woman who is a survivor of child sexual abuse. And the difference between her experience and my experience is that she was never trained to believe that power had been taken from her. The, the, all of the attention went on the abuser. And as far as she was concerned, she knew early on that he tried to take something from her or did not succeed because it's something she possesses and cannot be taken from her. And I thought about a lot of the work that we did in the centers. I mean, in the hospitals, we start that script right away. I think we need to start paying more attention and reimagining language because we talk about power being taken, you know, during rape. But is that a reality? You know, and, and a lot of our healing has been framed around taking this power back. And what I'm learning now is that I never lost the power. Like I wrote a poem recently to my rapist and I was, I'm talking to him without my power, with my power that I gave him that I put on him like clothes, he looked enormous, powerful, just invincible. And that's one of the reasons why he's been able to have residency in my body for so long. But when I stripped him down and took my power and I was the one holding it, I mean, we say that all the time, but if we taking power back, I think if we started doing it right in the beginning, when victims come into our centers or people come into our centers, maybe even not naming them victims, I'm thinking about that language too talking about power in a different way and stop talking about it as a thing that can be taken from us. But I don't know, I'm still developing these thoughts. So I'm still developing this thought, but it's moving inside me. And there's something, there's has, it's something to do with the way that we are languaging um, the beginning of this healing road for survivors that I think makes the road even longer. Um, and I'd like to see us reimagine a lot of different language around this and, and how um, when survivors come into these spaces, that that's like that we don't put on them that they've lost something, that we let them know automatic. I don't know. I'm still developing this, so I apologize for even starting that thought. But I'm thinking about this. Maybe somebody else will pick it up and <laughs> and finish your thought. Yeah. Well, I'll be talking about it more in my breakout session for we just Donna. The, yeah. next, the next question is the um, receiving calls regarding child sexual abuse on hotlines. Specifically, um, would like some insight on a child who reported sexual assault to her parents and her parents denied the abuse and focused on her brother who was the abuser. 
Mm -hmm. uh, his behavioral issues was their primary concern, not safety uh, for her. So thinking about those resources you would provide her family, things you might say to her, um, to the how folks calling. Child, hmm? child, and how child, child is a child and adult. How old is the child? Um, Nancy, how old is the child? Can you pop that in the chat there? Because it depends on what kind of access people mm -hmm. would have to the child. Right. Five. Are they still five or are they are they adult? I guess I'm just saying. Still five. All right. It's still five. Hmm. Well, I think this is where this is where a lot of the problems happen. I think <laughs> because here we go again. Childhood sexual abuse, I think for the most part, is such a devastating thing um, that when, um, when families are trying to grapple with this, I think that a lot of families, whether consciously or subconsciously, uh, really hope that children forget. So they try not to talk about it so much, right? It's like, let's not talk about it. So mm -hmm. won't, you won't remember. So you won't, you know, so it won't bother you. And in reality, it's, we, they're doing the worst thing possible, right? It's to talk about it, to figure out what their feelings are. And I think the, the survivor or the, the victim is often isolated and are not allowed to, to speak openly. Or if they are taken to a therapist and told to speak openly, it's, um, I, I always say, imagine, Imagine adults right now who are sexually assaulted. How many adults do you know just freely with no problem talk about their assault with a stranger? And now you go to a five-year-old or a six-year-old or seven-year-old. We expect children to do that straight off, right? And so I think that um, if they don't speak then, it's like speak now forever, hold your peace, um, or just, just yeah. like... Forget. The survivor told. And I so also think thinking I about think, it. Wait, wait. I, Two people are speaking at the same time. Wait, say that again. Inanna? I was thinking that um, because she said the survivor told, and one of the things I was thinking about, it depends on what your location is with this child. Because if it's a five-year-old, like a next door neighbor or something, or somebody you have access to like conversations with, you can build a conversation using power, you know, powerful language without addressing the thing, but still giving messages to the child that would help in some way. Um, I, I don't know. That's a difficult question. I want to have an answer for you. And I don't right now. But I, I think that there's two things happening at once. And I think that this, and I, you know, we were out of time essentially, but I think that there's, because it sounds like the brother committed, the brother, I don't know how old the brother is, but I'm assuming the Read brother the is a child as well. And so I think that there is kind of like probably I'm projecting, but I'm wondering, it's like they don't want to deal with it as is because then what what does that mean in terms of like, does he go to jail now, jail or foster care or, or all of that? So it becomes this thing of protecting him, prioritizing, prioritizing him and just kind of saying it's just he has a behavioral problem. And then so they're and, and then leaving her out in this instance, you know, hurt the child out the other child out so there are multiple things i of course am wondering like i don't think that we come here abusing um people so i'm like what's going on that this child is is, is harming their their sibling and is is that child also being harmed like i feel like there's all these things and so the parents are just like not really from what i've just read not dealing with any of it other than just kind of like oh he has behavioral problems not that's um, not a solution, Nancy, to your yeah. but it's just more just like looking at this, like trying to tease it out. Right? Because it's the bigger question, right? It's the bigger question about what we do around child sexual abuse that is the umbrella of the answer to that question. And we don't, I don't think in you know, we don't talk about when it's you know, I think not, no one wants to talk about it at all, but it's easier if it's this adult harming this child because then you know it's easier but then as in the case of ignacio and many when it's siblings it's like people don't want to they don't know what to do and they just kind of wring their hands and 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 just either as ignacio says you know let them you know hope it'll go away let them figure it out or you know all of these kinds of things that we there isn't there isn't um a lot of work around what to do when children cause harm to other children in a family. You know, there's all this stuff in terms of it's 
the outside kid who's doing something, but when in the family. Yeah. Yeah. I wish we had a better answer, but yeah. that's why the movement is still, you know, we're still moving and trying to figure this out. Um, I'm, I'm going to be thinking about that though, Nancy. Mm -hmm. And thank you, Maria, for sharing that because you're right. It, the, you know, that um, can be very, a lot older. Um, I guess, because the child is five, I was just like, even if they're 15, you know, 15, but you know, the sibling could, mm -hmm. you know, based on how it was, De described it sounded like there were two children involved mm -hmm. either way no it doesn't seem like the the person who was assaulted harmed that that family's doing anything in that way. i want to make sure that yeah our presenters and everybody gets a break that we are able to kind of take care of ourselves for about 15 minutes with some water step outside, do some deep breathing, um, conversations we're having about our own survivorships and other survivorships, they're hard and we keep doing it and that's good. Um, and we're gonna revisit that in our workshop in about 15 minutes. In the chat is the breakout session information. So if you are going to see uh, to Enina J's, you'll go to session three and the link is there. Uh, this is a Google Doc. Aisha is going to uh, session number one with Patricia and the ASL interpreters. And Ignacio is doing session number two with Kat and the Spanish interpreters. Um, so those will be more active. You can have your cameras on. You'll be able to unmute yourself and have more discussion. Um, so we'll see you again in about uh, 15 minutes. And Sol will stay here throughout in case you get lost. You can always pop back in here and uh, re-get the information. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. And there was someone who asked it about how to contact all of us and please reach out to Michelle. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, so. <laughs> I'll help yeah. you out. All Can right. I say one thing before we go? Of course, go ahead. For those of you who have noticed my mustache, I don't know how to <laughs> get off the filter and it's very, very distracted by the fact that I have a five o'clock shadow mustache, but it's not real. That's all. That's all. <laughs> you can't see it. I, I know. You can't see it. I know, but just in case, I don't want them to be like, well, you know, it, the lady with the mustache. <laughs> okay. Thank you. See you back in the breakout rooms in a few minutes. Thank you, everyone. Okay. All right. Bye. <laughs> I love when you get that a face, Aisha. <laughs> All right, let me go. <clears throat> okay, so you, uh, I'm going to leave this here for you. Are you here right now? I am here right now. Great. So um, for folks that are still here, please take a break. And then uh, click the link here to find your login if you don't have it in your email. Um, and we'll see you in the breakouts in about 15 minutes. Are we still recording this part? Oh, thank you.